We Are the Other People by Oberon Zell. Ding dong goes the doorbell. Is it Avon calling? Or perhaps Ed McMahon with my three million dollars? Nope, it's Yahweh's witless again. Just wanting to have a nice chat about the Bible. Boy, did they ever come to the wrong house. So we invite them in. Enter freely of your own will. Hey, it's Sunday morning. Nothing much going on here. So why not have a little entertainment? Diane and I amuse ourselves watching their expressions as they check out the living room. Great horned owl on the back of my chair. Ceremonial masks and medicine skulls of dragons and unicorns on the wall. Crystal wands, staves, swords. Lots of goddess figures and several altars. Boa constrictors draped in amorous embrace over the elk horn. White doves sitting in the hanging planters. Cats and weasels underfoot. Iron dragons snorting steam atop the wood stove. Posters and paintings of wizards and dinosaurs. And witchy women, some proudly naked. Sculptures of mythological beasties. And lots more dinosaurs wrapped on the six-star fields view screen of my computer. A five-foot model of the USS Enterprise and the skeleton of a placosaur hanging from the ceiling. Very, very many books, most of them dealing with obviously weird subjects, to say nothing of the great horned owl perched on the back of my chair and the unicorn grazing in the front yard, you know, early Adams family decor. And then, of course, it being late in the morning, you can expect Morning Glory to come wandering out naked, looking for her wake-up cup of tea. Morning Glory naked is truly an impressive sight, and the witless look as if she had a set of titties on stun as the immobilized hands clasped over their genitals with a large stage set and all the actors in place. The show is now ready to begin. Their mission, of course, is to save our heathen souls by turning us on to the word of their Lord, their Bible. I guess they figure some of us just haven't heard about it yet, and we're all eagerly awaiting their joyous tidings of personal salvation through giving our rational faculties to Jesus. Every time they come around, I look forward to trying out a new repost. Sure, it may be cruel and sadistic of me, but, hey, I didn't call them up and ask them to come over. They entered at their own risk. This time should be pretty good. After letting them run off their basic wrap, while lovely morning glory serves us all hot herb tea, I innocently remark, but none of that applies to us. We have no need for salvation because we don't have original sin. We are the other people. Huh? What? They reply eloquently. It's clear they've never heard this one before. Right, I say. It's all in your Bible. And I proceed to tell them the story using their own book for reference. Genesis 1.26 The Elohim said, Let us make humanity in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them be masters of the fish and sea, the birds of heaven, the cattle, all the wild beasts, and all the reptiles that crawl upon the earth. Elohim is a plural word, including male and female, and should properly be translated gods or pantheon. Genesis 1.27 The gods created humanity in the image of themselves. In the image of the gods they created them. Male and female they created them. Genesis 1.28 The gods blessed them, saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. Be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, and all living animals on the earth. Now, clearly here, we are talking about the original creation of the human species, male and female. All the animals, plants, etc., have all been created in previous verses. This is before the Garden of Eden, and Yahweh is not mentioned as the creator of these people. The next chapter talks about how Yahweh, an individual member of the Pantheon, goes about assembling his own special little botanical and zoological garden in Eden and making his own little man to inhabit it. Genesis 2-7 
Yahweh God fashioned a man of dust from the soil. Then he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and thus the man became a living being. Genesis 2.8 Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden, which is in the east, and there he put the man he had fashioned. Genesis 2.9 Yahweh God caused to spring up from the soil every kind of tree, enticing to look at and good to eat, with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Genesis 2.15 Yahweh God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and take care of it. Now, this next is crucial. Note Yahweh's precise words. Genesis 2.16 Then Yahweh God gave the man this admonition. You may eat, indeed, of all the trees in the garden. Genesis 2.17 Nevertheless, the tree of knowledge of good and evil you are not to eat, for the day you eat of it you shall most surely die. Fateful words, those. We will refer back to this admonition later. Then Yahweh decides to make a woman to go with the man. Now, don't forget that the Pantheon had earlier created a whole population of people, male and female, who are presumably doing just fine somewhere outside the gates of Eden. But this setup in Eden is Yahweh's own little experiment and will unfold to its own separate destiny. Genesis 2.21 So Yahweh God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and enclosed it in flesh. Genesis 2.22 Yahweh God built the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Right. Man gives birth to woman. Sure he does. Ha! But that's the way the story is told here. Now, both of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they felt no shame in front of each other. Well, of course not. Why should they? But take careful note of these words, as they also will prove significant. Now, this next part is where it starts to get interesting. Enter the serpent. Genesis 3.1 The serpent was the most subtle of all the wild beasts that Yahweh God had made. It asked the woman, Did God really say to you that you were not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Genesis 3.2 The woman answered the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. Genesis 3.3 3. But the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it, nor touch it under pain of death. Genesis 3, 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, No, you will not die. Genesis 3, 5. God knows, in fact, that the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. What a remarkable statement. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. The serpent directly contradicts Yahweh. Obviously, one of them has to be lying. Which one do you suppose? And if the serpent speaks true, wouldn't you wish to eat the magic fruit? Wouldn't it be a good thing to become like gods, knowing good and evil? Or is it preferable to remain in ignorance? Genesis 3.6 the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and pleasing to the eye, and that it was desirable for the knowledge that it could give. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She gave some also to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Genesis 3, 7 Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. The author makes an interesting assumption here, that if you realize that you are naked, you will automatically want to cover yourself. Further implications will unfold shortly in part two.